Okay, let me start with your amazing comments, as usual. Um, such a great class, really. I got to tell y'all, the level is just great, stellar. Almost, I'm almost nostalgic because I'm going to put the class in, in general ed now. It's going to be on Pathways, so it's going to get a lot of people who yeah. rise. It's, it's never going to be like this. This might be the last time. Wow. If I hate it, I'll take it off Pathways, but... I thought I'd give it a try, but this was amazing. Like such a concentration of intelligence, right? Beautiful. So, okay. So let me start with uh, Corporan. So you notice, uh, rightly so, a good note, good uh, observation, the paradox, right? Between Hevel and uh, happiness, enjoyment. How can I enjoy life if there's this kind of specter of Hevel looming over me, right? Remember, Hevel is the Hebrew word, right? That is being translated vanity, futility, meaninglessness. Let's write it down again. Right, poorly translated, right, in my view. Vanity, uh, well translated by Adler, breath, right, but otherwise meaningless and so forth, right? So she's asking, right, how can we, how can I truly enjoy myself if I, if everything is meaningless? That's is, I can't. So today we're going to look at the connection. You're right, they're actually, it's not a paradox, they're connected. Can't have one without the other. We're going to look at that specifically today. Your question about the woman in Ecclesiastes 7, I think, we answered a while back when we said that the woman represents wisdom in all of the works of Solomon. So probably there, and in the context of that verse, I haven't found one woman among a thousand. The context of that verse, if you read around it, it's about him looking for wisdom and not finding it. So it's a, many scholars agree that probably it's kind of he's just being poetic, waxing poetic about, you know, can't find lady wisdom. So you can go and reread it in the context and you'll see. Um, good. Uh, Michelle, uh, what did I write? Yes, the ending, the ending, the ending. A lot of you uh, looked at the ending. Let's look at the ending really quick. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's fun to look at really quick. So if you've read Ecclesiastes, the whole thing, you get the sense of a general tone, right? Mm -hmm. There's a certain tone in the book, which somehow, and I agree with most of you, from, from verse 12 on, right, the last couple verses, so chapter 12, verse 12 on, eh, even before, verse 9 on, right, the tone shifts, from this kind of, you know, very uncertain, nebulous, you know, confused climate to, okay, a further word. And then it's all like very like, tak, 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 uh, boot campish, right? Like here is the clear, the clear message now, you know? So uh, many scholars have, have noticed this, the, the change of tone and also the fact that it, the book itself, the, the poetic parts ends, right? With, um, where does it end? Right before, if you look at... Um, uh, verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 8 of chapter 12, you have the last vanity of vanities, right? And this is kind of the whole, is framing, right? He began like that, he closes with that, you you sense that the discourse of the Kohelet is finished, and then it looks like somebody pops in, right? Maybe it looks like a different author, and possibly is, right? Another word, <laughs> because Kohelet was a sage, talking about Kohelet now, he continued to instruct people, he listened, blah, blah, blah. And then now, you know, here is the end of the sum of the matter. Fear God, observe his commandments, blah, blah, blah. And that's the ending, right? Okay, so what can we make? So clearly, I'm going to go with the idea that uh, we can do both. We can say it's Solomon adding this kind of little postscript, you know, um, playfully, I would say, because it's not in the style of Solomon at all, <laughs> right? Or we can say it's a later author. Doesn't matter. Why is this ending there? What's the purpose of this ending? Uh, how are we supposed to understand this? Uh, why do you think it's been added there? Yeah. I mean, like I kind of feel like the whole text is inviting people to question like what the meaning of life is and if it matters whether or not like whether they observe God's commandments. I mean, it's just like despite everything that was just said, like don't forget <laughs> to the Jews what you're here for. Yes, yes. Like, just in case you got confused, yeah. right? As you were reading this, just in case you got lost along the way here, at least remember this and you'll be fine, right? So for me, it sounds kind of like that, right? It's like, okay, just in case we've wandered very far, just in case you we lost you there, just in case you drowned, <laughs> right? Into the confusion of, of Kohelet, uh, here, 
you know, here's a raft. <laughs> here's a, what do you call these uh, circular things you throw to people who are drowning? Life preserver. Here's a life preserver, right? So I, I see it like that, yeah. right? You want to say something? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I think much like the ending of Job, I think people are characters, are cowards and they don't like that end. <laughs> yeah, they no. It... Something at the end and say, okay, yeah, I know you just read this entire depressing paper and you don't really want to be that, but you don't change it all the way at the end so you have a happy that, that, Exactly, that's what it looks like. Um, although he's not contradicting, right? I, wanted, I want you to notice, he's not contradicting. There is really, um, they're not contradictory texts, but the, the tonality is very different. So, uh, so I just wanted to say that this could be either Ecclesiastes playfully giving a kind of, you know, traditional ending or somebody else. I don't like this idea of, you know, later scribes or whatever. It's always the cowardly way out. Um, I, I can see Ecclesiastes himself penning that and, you know, with a smile, um, a little ironic smile, you know, here, just in case, you know, uh, let me kosherize my book or, you know, let me, let me give it a stamp of, you know, kosher so that people will still read. So, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up a little bit. It's It's an interesting ending. Um, and and, um, and and not so contradictory, actually, when you really, well, we're going to look at the text today and we'll see that there's not too much of a contradiction. So good, uh, good observation. Um, Epstein, I think you found the uh, heart of what we're going to do today. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 25. Very good. <laughs> you sensed the, where the shift occurs. So I'm going to come back to that. Well done. Um, Davidov. I liked your question about uh, are there connections between Eastern thought and Ecclesiastes? Um, certainly, actually, because remember Ecclesiastes, the empire of, of Solomon, uh, so even historically stretched all the way to India, right? We know there were trade routes. We know there were trade. There was trade going on between the Far East and uh, the kingdom of Solomon. So, uh, and certainly... There, there, there would have been uh, also intellectual influences. I see a lot of connections between this and Buddhism, like you said, and we can point them out. I mean, one of the main, we can point them out at the end, but uh, actually let's let's wait till the end because when, when we've done the chapter today, you'll see very clearly. So yes, a very good uh, um, observation, which works even historically and even in the text, you can find connections. That was nice. Uh, yes, Kaplan at the ending, <laughs> I just covered that. Uh, Rivera, likewise, and you notice where you you notice that Kohelet is feminine, right? The word for Ecclesiastes, right? We translated Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew. It's Kohelet, which means what does it mean? Kahal is assembly, so Kohelet is anybody know <laughs> the one who speaks it before an assembly. <laughs> To assemble, come to do this. I know, Kahal is to assemble, so the assembler? <laughs> the one who assembles? One who assembles. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's interesting. The one who gathers, the one who assembles, the feminine. I mean, we can do something with that. It can become, you can do a little midrash, <laughs> right? About this being a mother's house text, right? It's about gathering people. Um. So we could we could go there a little bit too. Um, nice, good. And then Suresh, you mentioned this again. This verse um, can uh, can the straight be made crooked, right? And what we're going to see with Ecclesiastes is the idea that even in the crooked we can find <laughs> right a path. Uh, most of the Bible is about becoming straight, <laughs> not in the sense that we say today, but it's about <laughs> walking the straight line. Remember Job? What was what was how was he described? Remember the two words that describe Job? Sure. and Yasha. What was Yasha? Straight. Straight. <laughs> Meaning you're walking. You know, you're following the path of the ancestors. You are not going to the left or to the right. You're you're just you know really doing the right thing without moving left or right. Um, that's the path of the majority of the biblical text is you want to be yasha, straight. Solomon is crooked, <laughs> right? And in the crooked path, he's going to find uh, also some truth, right? So I, I, I would see it like that. So thanks for bringing that up. That is definitely, he doesn't want to make the crooked straight, <laughs> right? Even within the crooked, you can find something interesting. Okay, good. All right, let's get into the text. So today we focus on chapter two. 
because between one and two, we cover the whole thing. <laughs> so, uh, so let's re re uh, remember again what we did with uh, one. Um, so remember, this is a book about a king who has lost his ma'at, right? He has lost his goddess. And as a result, chaos is now abounding in the sense that there is no justice, right? Ba'at is the goddess of justice. And he himself now is losing his grip on the kingdom. He's losing his authority, the source of his authority. And then, of course, uh, we're going to see how he, in chapter two, how he continues, right, to struggle to, to, to somehow regain control, <laughs> right? That's really chapter two, is the struggle of the king to regain control over the situation that is becoming more and more chaotic. Um, and we saw, or I, we're going to see today, how because of the lack of balance, right, with the goddess Ma'at, with the feminine, he's losing the feminine. He's losing, well, who's the other uh, female he's lost in, in addition to Ma'at in, the, in, in this text? Who else did he lose? <laughs> Exactly, right? He's seeking out, he's losing all the women. <laughs> so he lost Ma'at, he's, he's losing Lady Wisdom, right? And we're going to see that uh, he's trying to regain, right, this, what he lost. He's after something. Uh, and we're going to see how he, in a way, hits a wall, hits, hits rock bottom. And then we're going to see his epiphany, how he finds uh, how he's able to find again his ma'at, right? Okay, so let's let's go to chapter two. Um, if you read chapter two from the beginning, we are uh, looking at a man uh, who is now out of balance, right? We talked about this briefly in the introduction. This is the um, uh, exacerbation of the masculine, right? The too much yang, you know, the yin yang, right? The it's a great uh, concept, right? The yin is the feminine. The yang is the masculine, the feminine is more receptive, right? It's kind of what we're doing in the class too. And the yang is more active. We have a flurry of activity in chapter two. We have an exacerbation of doing, right? Pure father's house, but toxic father's house, right? It's doing, doing, doing. Uh, so let's look a little bit at this doing. So that's why I call it toxic masculinity, right? In the sense that it's 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 a masculinity which is out of balance. There's no more feminine. It's a, it's going too much towards the masculine. It's just too much doing, <laughs> right? Uh, and in a way, he uh, it makes things worse, right? So let's look a little bit at that. Um, so we we see first of all uh, in chapter two, um, which I feel like starts earlier, but. <laughs> I feel like uh, chapter one, verse 12 is already the beginning of this quest, right? I mean, let's, so let's go there. Chapter one, verse 12 is really when we switch from um, a new idea. I, Kohelet, was king in Jerusalem over Israel. I set my mind to study, to probe wisdom. So first quest, set my mind to study, right? Activity. <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'm going to conquer this, right? And then he continues, an unhappy business, <laughs> but that which God gave men to be concerned with. And then he's, he says, I observed, right, all the happenings, but we talked about this last time. And then the, we have the twisted thing. And then he said, I hear have go grown richer, wiser. So now we're moving from wisdom to wealth, to the success story of Solomon, right? He, um, And this is uh, continuing chapter two, verse one, after this notion of... Um, Wealth, which we'll come back to in a bit, uh, pleasure. Now he's seeking pleasure actively. Come, I will treat you to merriment, taste mirth. And he's, you know, just really uh, actively seeking pleasure. I venture to tempt my flesh with wine and grasp folly. Um, I multiplied my, uh, my possessions. So he's moving now into another aspect, which is work, right? So notice the three things that he's after. Wisdom, pleasure, work. Where did we see these three? Where did we see these three all together? Wisdom, pleasure in the sense of eating, drinking, and work. Where are all these three activities found together? Wisdom, work, Eating, drinking, 
with the work in the Inanna story? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the brother is working. <laughs> she puts him to work. Yes, you, that's true. And the pleasure also. But even in the biblical text, we study the story uh, together. <laughs> Where you have wisdom, quest for wisdom. You have the quest for pleasure. Uh, something tasting yeah. good. Yes. <laughs> right. The, the creation story. Uh, remember, right? Genesis 3. She sees the tree and sees that it is... What? How did she put it? Um, we're getting there. Let's see what she saw. Uh, anybody remember this by 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 memory? Uh, where is it? Chapter three. Let's look at her. Ah, when she's looking at that tree, help me find it. Um, boom, boom, boom. Okay, she saw that the tree was good for eating, a delight to the eyes. I'm in chapter three, verse six, and that the tree was desirable as a source for wisdom. So we have right Genesis three. We have the desirable right good good to eat right we have the notion of wisdom where do we have work in genesis in those stories yeah we have god's work but the point is that she didn't deserve that work. right but also who else is working in the garden yeah they're both supposed to work the land <laughs> right they're supposed to so the garden is a place of work also not just pleasure not just with so you see how in their allusions ecclesiastes when he's writing he has in the back of his mind we know already genesis one until three one to three he has it in the back of his mind so when he's over here seeking pleasure seeking to uh, you know success through work seeking wisdom what is he seeking actually life is a life almost almost what is he seeking creation uh, God. I would say, or I would say Eden, right? He's seeking Eden. He's trying to go back to that which we lost. He's trying to grasp something which has been forbidden, right? Remember, Solomon is all about entering forbidden places. The Garden of Eden, how do we know it's forbidden? Who forbade? How? What happened? How? What do you do? You don't do it. Now, after they were expulsed, what did he place at the entrance of oh. Wow. <laughs> exactly right it's forbidden of course solomon wants to go there and so this is really him trying to get back into eden to find that original bliss that the humanity has lost and he's trying so actively so with so much effort trying to find it i mean look at this go go to to uh last if not go to ecclesiastes 2 which i'm gonna take three hours to find now because um yeah here we are go back to ecclesiastes 2 right i'm on verse 4 I multiplied my possessions. I built houses. I planted vineyards. I laid out gardens. I planted every kind of fruit tree. Are you seeing the semantic field of creation, right? Um, it constructed pools of water to irrigate. I bought male and female slaves. I acquired stewards. I acquired cattle, herds, flocks, blah, blah, blah. Amassed silver, gold. Look at all he's doing to get back into Eden. And then the conclusion, of course. <laughs> and oh, verse 11. It was all futile and pursuit of wind, right? So that's what I want you to see, right? Read between the lines. When you're reading this beginning of chapter two, it has a semantic field. We call that a semantic field. It's a, it's a language, same concepts of creation story, right? You see references upon references to Genesis 1 and 2. So you know what's happening. There is more than a man trying to build himself. It's a man trying to penetrate back into the forbidden garden of Eden, right? Um, some sages tried to go back there too. What happened to them? Four sages, you know the story. Four sages tried to go back. Crazy. One crazy. And one became the past state. Mm -hmm. yeah. Forgot uh -huh. what other crazy apostate or one died one died and the last one walked Rabbi. out on supposedly okay. made it <laughs> rabbi akiva very famous rabbi he made it but three out of the four companions who tried to penetrate back into eden like solomon is doing that lost their mind died lost their faith right it's a very a uh, dangerous task which solomon is trying to do right and he fails Right. We see that. So make sure you write this down. Right? This is about re this is about going back to Eden, finding the original bliss of life. He's trying to make it happen, to seek it, to, to he's trying to force his way back into Eden and he fails lamentably. Uh, and and uh, let's let's remind ourselves. Uh, let's look at the Hevel one more time in this passage, by the way. 
Havel is mentioned. Anybody counted them? How many Havels we have in chapter two? Guess. It's such an easy number. <laughs> Seven. Yes. You can count that. I'll give you the reference. Of course. I'll give you the references. Chapter two, verse one, verse 11, verse 15, verse 17, verse 21, verse 23, and verse 26. Havel. Right? Now, guess. It echoes another passage where you have seven times another word that is used, which is the antithesis of Haven. What is the antithesis of Haven? Good. Yes. Thank you. You guys are getting it. Good in the creation stories. How many times? Wild guess. Seven. Yes. <laughs> Genesis 1, verse 3, verse 9, verse 12, verse 18, 21, 25, 31. Right? So we have again, right? He's He's writing his this passage with in mind the creation story, right? And he's he's you can see how he's struggling to get back into Eden. It's heaven, 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 heaven. Yes. To the what? Yeah. Uh, tell me how. Mm, yes. Uh, he tries to go into the garden, get the thing of immortality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. Yeah. This whole idea of trying to kind of... Nice. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Yes. Write this down. Gingamesh, whom we met earlier, right? The kind of uh, barbaric lover of Inanna. Uh, also, there, if you read the epic of Gilgamesh, which you all should, it's not long. Uh, he also tried to penetrate into the forbidden garden in order to get, what was it, the flower or plant of immortality? Oh. Yeah. And then, of course, who did he lose the plant to? It's funny. Snake. <laughs> a snake, <laughs> right? A snake comes and same kind of story, right? We are in the same era, same time span, right? Very nice. Yes, good point. So, yes, King Solomon is a nice, a, I can see nice connections with Gilgamesh. This is interesting. Gilgamesh built the first city. He was the first hero of the Sumerian culture. And Solomon, in a way, is mirroring this kind of very manly, and Gilgamesh is very, uh, a, kind of very macho, right? Gilgamesh is somebody who, um, in the end, despises Inanna, right? He, uh, she, she tried to seduce him one more time, and he just, <laughs> in the epic of Gilgamesh, he sends her, you know, packing. Yes. There's also a kind of thing that I wrote about at one point in Gilgamesh, where in the story of Gilgamesh, there's also Enkidu, and then Kidu has also this kind of crisis moment where he realizes he's dying and he, he made a door at one point in the story and then he sees this door after he's kind of cursed with dying or like disease and he gets really mad that the door is going to outlast him even though he made the door for his own use. The door, the door, you mean a door? door? Like just a regular door, just a door that he made. He made a door, like a door? Yeah, <laughs> out, of, out of like a really fancy tree. I oh, okay, okay. A tree was Interesting. And he gets, yeah, and he gets really mad yeah. if he breaks the, like, the, the door off its hinges and it's raised and like that kind of Solomon's whole thing. Like, I don't like how my other generations are going to enjoy the things that I've made. Yes. And, Nice. Yes. Very good. Very good. Uh, I like the connections you guys are making. Very good. Okay. So, so we're at this point right now where he has hit rock bottom, right? And, and the, the, the Hevel, remember, let's remind ourselves the meaning of that, right? This is Hevel doesn't mean, it does not mean vanity. It does not mean meaningless. It, literal translation, breath, not the in breath, the, the powerful breath, which is normally called Rua, right? Which is the powerful breath of life. This is not what we mean, right? No, um, which is breath of life. But heaven is just the expiration, right? Breath like uh, something you blow, right? Something that when you breathe that way, it's an exhalation, right? You breathe in, you possess the breath, and then the breath goes, right? So the connotation of heaven, let's remind ourselves, is the fact that it is something I cannot contain. It is something I can't keep. I can't possess. You cannot possess your breath. Your breath constantly escaping you, right? You try, and then it goes, right? That's the idea. So the meaning of Hevel, I think the best way to understand it is to understand it as the sense of something slipping through your fingers, right? That is what King Solomon is realizing. I tried to achieve this, but it slipped through my fingers. Hevel, right? That's, that's what he means. Now, it's interesting. He hits rock bottom, and then there's a powerful turning point. And I want us to go there, and Epstein already found it. Very good. <laughs> chapter 2, verse 25. Chapter 2, actually, verse 24. Right? Now, we're going to analyze this closely. If you have the Hebrew, it's even better. 
because it's going to be very interesting. Chapter 24, there's a number of shifts. Uh, I'm going to read it in English. So uh, all of a sudden in chapter 24, the translation sucks uh, because it misses the appearance of the word tov. Boom, out of the blue. Good, right? All of a sudden, you have heaven, 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 and all of a sudden, tov, right? Which is from where? Where do we have this? Everywhere? Yes. Genesis 1, okay? So all of a sudden, he says, right, ain't tov. In verse 24, there's nothing better, that's the translation, or there's nothing as good as, right? There's no good as, right? Something like that. As uh, there's nothing as good as a man to eat or drink and afford himself enjoyment. And even that I noted comes from the hand of God for he who eats and enjoys, but myself for to the man who pleases him, he has given wisdom and to him who displeases him, he has given the urge and so forth. Okay, so we have several things happening here. We have a shift. Solomon, in a way, is shifting. His, his uh, positioning is shifting from heaven to tov. Can you tell me why all of a sudden now he's able to see the tov of life and appreciate it? In spite, or maybe because of the heaven. Well, look at that. What's the shift? Yes. Ain't yes, ain't tov. Yeah, but it's a expression to mean there's nothing as good as this, right? It's not that he's saying it's not good. He's not saying it's not good to enjoy. He's saying there's nothing as good as enjoying. You see what I'm saying? No? What do your translation? You don't agree with the translation? It, nobody, does anyone have a different translation? Yeah, what? That is preface of there's no good in a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no good in a man who eats and drinks. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have to go back on that. I have a feeling it means that, but I have to go back to that. Yeah, that's what I have too, right? All the yeah. translations are unanimous. Your, the translation also, nobody agrees with the translation, that's fine, but <laughs> but I can go and investigate the Hebrew. I can do that. So hold that thought, right? Yeah. Right, we have. I'll check. I'll check the grammar. Yeah, I'll, I'll, exactly. That's. But I need to check. I will check that. But so for now, we'll go with the translation, and I will check to give you some more <laughs> details on how to read it in the Hebrew and um, how to understand the Ain Tov. Right. Very good. So in any case, we have Tov there. We have Tov again in verse twenty-six. Right, and we have Tov again one more time in verse uh, same same verse twenty-six. Right. Um, uh, let's see if I can find it in the English. It, it doesn't come out in the... Uh, so verse 26, to the man, namely, okay, to the man who is good before him, right? For the man who is good before God, that's the translation here, or pleases God, who is good before God. Uh, to him, God gives blah, blah, blah. And then it says, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, what, was, what was the explanation that you were going to give us to why he views these things? Why he's switching to tub? Yeah. I'm going. That, that's where I'm oh. going. <laughs> that's where I'm investigating. But I want you to see the three tubs, right? So, and then finally, uh, let's see. Uh, he has given good um, uh, uh, to, uh, and then we have the ending, right? So we have the, the word tub appearing three times in the Hebrew, and it doesn't come out so much in translation. So my question to you is, verse, this is verses 24 to 26. Right, and you have the word tov right at the beginning, and then you have the man who is good before God, verse twenty six, and that's the other tov, and then we have um, a, the one who gives, uh, the one who is pleasing to God. Again, the same idea, the one who is good before God. Right, so we have tov, tov, tov. Okay, so I want you to tell me what. What in Solomon has shifted that all of a sudden now, instead of seeing Hevel, he sees Tov. He is now, all of a sudden, you have to see this. He is, I know you guys love this language, astro-projected, right? He has been translated into the Garden of Eden. He's seeing good everywhere. He's there. He made it. What happened? You see what I'm saying? If you're, there's more from the Garden of Eden. There is the repetition of give, give, give three times. Let me give it. And the give, of course, is keyword in Genesis 1, where God, gives to Adam and Eve, he gives to them the fruit to eat and so forth, right? So give, Natan, let's have another key word, right? Which is found still here. It's like a detective story. 
um, to give. So the word give, Natan, is a key word also in the Genesis 1, where God gives, right? He's giving Adam and Eve the, the fruits and the grasses to eat. And you find this here three times. Let me tell you where. Uh, you see it very well in the English, actually. Um, let's see, where is the first one? Okay. Uh, verse 26. They're all in verse 26. To the man who pleases God, he has given wisdom. To the one who displeases, he has given the urge. And finally... Uh, yes, uh, three times in the Hebrew, he's giving, giving, giving. You have the word Natan and uh, finally Latet. Okay, now, so we are clearly, so I want you to notice this, we are clearly, somehow he has been translated, he has found his way, he has astro-projected back into Eden. I want you to tell me, how did he do it? What is the shift here? in his positioning that would have brought him from before where he's ah, trying to find, you know, building, amassing, doing this, doing that. And all of a sudden, poof, here he is. What's the difference? Can you see it between this section? This section should sound radically qualitatively different. It's a different atmosphere from the one we just studied. Yes. Because these things are about things God has given directly to him. Very good, right? That's basically the shift. He's shifting from doing to receiving. That's the shift we see. Look how the multiplication of his doings. I laid out, I planted, I bought, I acquired, I amassed, I got, I gained, I, 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 with action, action, action. And now all of a sudden, God, and I received, right? So that's the shift. He's shifting. He's doing a father's house, mother's house shift, right? From doing me, I'm at the center, I'm in control, I'm making it, to now, I can't do it, <laughs> right? To now, uh, God at the center, and you are on the receptive end, right? Okay, so let's look at this, right? Let's talk about this a little bit, because this is significant. This is the main breakthrough that King Solomon has found and is guiding us into, right? It, basically, what he's saying is that the only way to find Eden is what? Without even leaving your seat, you can be astral projected or you can be translated or you can be in the spirit of Eden. What do you what needs to shift within ourselves for us to find our way there? Um, or is it forever inaccessible to us? Yes, I think he's kind of saying that we're all already there. We just have to flip the switch and understand that. It's already been given to us. We just have to be one to receive it. Exactly, right? This is a shift of perspective. We are already still, We Eden is still all around us, perhaps, but we do not see it because we are so busy trying to control everything. Eden is a mentality. It's not some place, geographical place. It's a mentality. And the mentality is gratitude and joyful expectation for the gifts of God. If you dwell in that attitude, if you position yourself like this, you will be in Eden at every point of your life. Let me say it again, right? Eden is an attitude. What did I say? Um, <laughs> by which you live in gratefulness, that's number one, and joyful expectation of the gifts of God, right? You live knowing that it's not up to you. Whew, relief, <laughs> right? Huge relief. To know that it's not up to you is already you can breathe. Exhale. <laughs> Remember the movie? No, you don't know this back in the day. Wait, maybe you know this. Waiting to Exhale with Whitney Houston and, and, and company. Y'all know Whitney Houston? No? Don't know Whitney Houston? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Long time ago, 80s. <laughs> right? It's a movie about, you know, just... It's a, it's a chick flick about, you know, <laughs> women who are just stressed about their lives and the movie is waiting to, it's how, you know, you try to make it, make it, and you never really exhale. And the movie is all about, you know, waiting to exhale till I get there, then I can, you know. King Solomon is saying, it's now, now you can exhale. It is an attitude whereby you recognize that you cannot control your destiny. You can only receive it. That's the idea here. Let me say it again. This is the realization that you cannot control your destiny. You cannot control your happiness. You cannot control your success. You can only receive it. And at that moment, when you realize that, okay, it's not my hands. I can relax. I can still work and do what I need to do, but the, the outcome doesn't depend on me, right? At that moment where you realize everything is a gift and nothing is, you know, a, a duty or something you can make happen, you are already in Eden. You've made it. 
Does that make sense? Am I make sense? That's the shift. Yes. The recognition of life is short, but that life is also a gift from God. And everything, everything that you have in life is a gift from God. And it's there for you to enjoy and to appreciate. And not to just drive and try to try. Exactly, and right? Try to try to point it. Right, you can work, yeah, right? Work is not pointless, but yeah. endless driving. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly right the, it is you still work but you don't work in an attitude of striving you work in an attitude that i'm going to do my part and in the end it's not in my hands i can relax right yes yeah like i think also like the fact that he says hello and cold it's not like a contradiction mm -hmm. because just because something is fleeting it doesn't mean that it has to be bad that's true yes yeah some of the best things in life are fleeting right <laughs> All of, you, all of you are fleeting. <laughs> I am fleeting, <laughs> right? And yet we're amazing, right? Uh, contrary to Epstein, who thinks we, we, we are useless. <laughs> right? So, very good. Okay, so now, now it doesn't end there. Careful. What's the ending? We, we've reached a climax, but all of a sudden we just come crashing down. Do you see the ending? You're past me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> right there, the ending of chapter two. Oh. Yes, that is a downer too. <laughs> What's the last sentence in chapter two? We can't avoid this. <laughs> We've come to a climax. Yes, Eden. We are all in Eden. Should we receive the gifts of God? And then this too <laughs> is Havel, right? Now, what is he saying? Why does he choose to end with Havel and not Tav? I would have been happier if he ended with Tav. He ends the thing with Havel. What's he doing? Why? Why must he end in this way? Why does he choose to end? Uh, why is this anti-climax happening to us? Why would he do that? We're soaring, you know, we were soaring in Eden. We were, you know, receiving all the gifts. We were, and now he's like, ah, ah, ah. But remember, Haven. <laughs> why must we constantly keep Haven before us, even in the moment of enjoyment? Uh, every moment of our life, we have to keep Havel before us. Why? What happens if we forget Havel? What's the temptation? Yeah. I mean, like you start to take things for granted, kind of, and also like I think purpose and like meaning comes in the fact that it's not permanent. Okay. And and what else? Imagine you you receive all those gifts. You receive a beautiful partner. You receive a great job. You have a beautiful house. What's the temptation as you begin to receive all those gifts that you, all of a sudden you might start to think maybe that you. that you did it, right? And so Solomon is saying, yeah, 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 but never forget, Haven. It's not you. <laughs> it's not in your control. It's not in your hand. <sighs> It slips through the fingers, right? Um, this is the key to retaining the attitude of enjoyment. What happens when you get too successful? What's the time? How do you start to lose the enjoyment as a successful person? You've received a lot of gifts. You've, you've made it into Eden. You're doing great. You look good. How can you lose your joy? What would happen? And how does Havel put you back in the right state? So you said, take it for granted, but how's another way? You got a nice house, you got a nice spouse, you have a good job. Yeah. So can you think of your possessions as if they're not really your own, don't really feel sad when you lose them? Exactly, right? It keeps you in a state of freedom, right? Because in a way you realize none of this, right? I don't have to hold on to this. This is not in my control. I don't have, therefore, to continue to amass and consolidate and make more and more money to make sure that it stays, right? That's the problem. You make a little money, you immediately want to make more, right? You get a nice house, immediately it's got to be bigger, right? Because you want to consolidate what you have, right? And he say, uh-uh, never, you know, it doesn't help because anyways, you didn't do it, right? So the Havel is a constant reminder of our of, of, of the fact that we are not in control. And to be constantly reminded that we are not in control, two things happen. Number one, we relax. Number two, we are able to receive. That's why we ought to constantly remember we are not in control. Anytime you start to get too ambitious, right? Or stressed about consolidating your possessions. Hey, then. Ah, it's not in my hands, right? It doesn't come from me anyways. I can relax. And at the same time, 
I remain open, right? So Hevel, in a way, is what keeps us in the state of grace, of receptivity. You see the connection, Corcoran, now, right? Without the Hevel, we start to become anxious again. Oh, I got to make it happen. Oh, my house, I got to have, you know, fire insurance and, you know, life insurance. And I need to make sure my house. And now I need to buy more and more and more. And we get anxious and anxious and we lose the pleasure, the joy, right? So Hevel constantly is reminding ourselves, I am not making this happen. These are gifts. They come and they go. They're not in my control. To live in this state of complete grace is what keeps us, right, in the state of joy. Um, that's what, uh, so interesting way to end. The book is read at what Jewish festival? Sukkot. Okay, why? Tell us first, of, tell us about Sukkot and tell us why you think it's read during Sukkot. Um, okay, what does Sukkot celebrate? A three day Sukkot. So <laughs> the uh, that's the the traveling through the desert. Yes, the biblical reason, please. <laughs> uh, sustaining of the Jewish people. Yes, very good. Sukkot is the remembrance holiday, which remembers how when the Hebrews were in the desert, and when the Hebrews, how did they eat in the desert? Manna. And who gave the manna? God. Right, they ate from the hand of God, right? Like the child eats from the hand of, right? Like your pet. <laughs> right? So uh, make sure you write this down. It's very important. The fact that this book is read during Sukkot. Sukkot is the time when God sustained the Israelites in the desert, where they depended completely on God, right? Where they lived in tents, right? Just like the holiday of Sukkot invites us to live in tents for a whole week, right? And, and they lived without any security. And yet the main uh, emotion that is commanded during Sukkot is what? What's the only emotion that is commanded during There's an, an emotion that is commanded. Thankfulness. Not thankfulness, joy, right? It's commanded. I mean, along with a long list of sacrifices, there's one more command, be joyful. It's forced. <laughs> right. Connection between precariousness and joy. This is the holiday of Sukkot. Connection between precariousness, which... It makes possible uh, receiving everything from the hand of God. That's the what Sukkot commemorates, is the fact that everything we are, we have received, right? And now we can relax because it's not in our hands. Yes. Like the longest of the period, possession from the Jews. Because if you're having a very simple um, structure that you want, so everyone's equal. Very good. Right? Yes. Equalizer. Exactly. Bringing it comes from God and brings it down to that level of that equalizer in the same way that Hevel is equal. Exactly. Yes. Equalizer because at death, we are all equal whether we are. Or exactly. Yeah, very good. So important connections here, right? You you to understand the book of Ecclesiastes, it helps to connect it to the festival to which it is has been associated, right, by the rabbis, right? It's also the a new beginning, right? Yes, excellent. Very good. So Sukkot is a kind of loss, which right, kind of, and also a new beginning. Very good. Okay, good. This is the theology of the book of Ecclesiastes. If you understood this, you're good. You missed the most important part. I don't know how, unless you took it before with me, I don't remember. I've taught this before. Okay, so make sure you watch the recording because you missed it, the climax. <laughs> okay, now, um, it, when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, this passage, right? Enjoy, let's just end with that. Rejoice, you know, what and so forth. It happens, I think, two or three more times, right? And it, it, those other times will include the wife, the feminine element, right? So in, in the book, this passage about receiving, about um, enjoyment, about the state of grace where you are receiving from God rather than doing is very, and I'm sorry, I didn't do the inventory, but 
in the other passages, it is associated with enjoying the wife, right? So you have now the feminine element has been reintegrated. So you can see how King Solomon has had, he will fall back into the, he will lose his mat a few more times, <laughs> right? Throughout the, the book, but he will always emerge with this same passage, right? So he's, he will be moving through, I mean, he doesn't have a, a once and for all revelation, right? You can see that he struggles with this vision, right? He will fall back into the, the king who has lost his crown, right? Uh, over and over again. And then he will resurface into this feminine dimension, right? I call it a mother's house dimension because it is receptivity. The wife is associated to that. It is a different approach to life and then he falls back into the toxic masculinity and then he reemerges. the whole book is going to be this back and forth but that is really in essence the this is the guiding thread of the book we have understood the direction right um yes anybody know where the other passages are did you anybody do the inventory by any chance do i have to do it myself <laughs> Of all the other times, well, the other times where it says enjoy, rejoice, and then occasionally there's the wife also in there. Um, but that that's something we can do. Um, chapter nine, like one of the ones with the wife. Yeah, there's one in chapter. There's earlier ones. It's it's at least three or four times, yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, jot jot those down, right? Take uh, read it again. Find all those passages because that's the guiding thread. This is the what do you call this? Uh, this uh, there's a myth in Greece about the Ariadne. Yeah, 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 yeah. That thread. Yeah. What, was it? Yeah, like she's lost in the maze, right? Is that it? And then she has a thread. She, she gives the string to Theseus. String. To guide That's it. This is the string, guys, to guide you through the <laughs> it's not keep the commandments and fear God. Is the this thing, this enjoyment, these moments of enjoyment are the guiding threads here that get Solomon in moments where Solomon is emerging. And reconnecting with his ma'at, right? Reconnecting with the feminine. That would be my reading of the text. Okay, good. Any questions? Any comments? Did you, did you have a similar explanation as to why uh, Ruth is read on Shavuot? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, Shavuot is the giving of the Torah. Uh -huh. What does Ruth teach? <laughs> Doesn't teach about the Torah, but something else equally important. Foundational. I'm blanking. Ah, what's the main word that is ascribed to Ruth? Main word. Humility. Nope. <laughs> what what no no <laughs> uh, yeah chesed 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 four times chesed remember loving kindness how's that connected to the giving of the torah I'm curious what's the goal of the torah what's the goal of all the commandments people learn how to relate yes <laughs> learn chesed she is the embodiment already. So the the rab actually rabbis give this explanation. They say we read Ruth on Shavuot. Why? Because she is the embodiment of the Torah. Because she found what the Torah is trying to get to, which is Chesed. That's I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> that's what they say. So that's the idea. She she she's in a way embodying the essence of the Torah, which is love, right? In that sense, does that make sense? So all the all the holidays is very interesting to see the connection mm -hmm. between the text and and a lot of these texts that are studied during the holidays are mother's house texts, right? We have the Book of Esther, which we skipped, which is coming, Ruth, Song of Songs during Shabbat, connected to the holidays. There are meanings there, right? Okay, good. Let me stop this recording, and next time we.